Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Cancer Support Community Central Ohio's Lunchtime Learning. We are very excited today to have with us Jerry Schneider from the Retirement Strategies LTD and the Central Ohio Professional Education Council. We are very appreciative of him uh, coming in to share his knowledge and expertise on um, understanding and knowing um, and how to keep your important vital paperwork documented. And so, um, Jerry, I am um, going to um, turn that over to you. Thank you very much. And um, I appreciate being here today as well. I like to talk on this subject, but I need to disclose right away that I'm not the most organized person in the world. And in fact, I'm far from that. But uh, in the course of my uh, career, I've talked to many clients, of course, and many prospective people. So I've tried to gather maybe the best practices that different people have had uh, to share with you today. I also want to mention, though, that we're going to talk about a couple of different systems of organization, and uh, but it's very important that if you have a system that works for you, in no way am I recommending that you change that. But maybe along the lines, you can pick up a couple ideas or things that maybe you've, you've not thought of that uh, hopefully will help you out. Um, again, from a background standpoint, I'm here actually representing a nonprofit that I'm involved with and helped create about 12 years ago. It's called COPEC, uh, and it stands for Central Ohio Professional Education Council. Um, like I said, it's a 501c3 organization, been around about 12 years. We have about 24 speaking members representing different disciplines. We're kind of the financial retirement type uh, uh, discipline, but we have many other speakers that I invite you to maybe consider uh, for future programs. And you can go on, I think, if I don't have the website there, it is COPEC, and again, it's C-O-P-E-C, uh, education.org. So as individuals that might want to tune into programs, we, we do a lot virtually as well. Uh, we have what we call Financial Fridays at 11 o'clock. Uh, so please uh, go on our website and, and look and see if there's any speakers or programs that might interest you. All of the speakers, such as myself, agree to do two things, volunteer our time to give programs such as this, but also uh, most of the speakers agree to meet individually with people on these subjects of importance. You know, there's only so much we can do as kind of in a group setting. So we are willing to uh, usually meet individually to tailor it to you as an individual. Two things, no sales and no pushing of products or no pushing about our companies that we represent. So that you know who's talking to you, I will mention, uh, I was the founder of financial, um, of our financial company, Retirement Strategies. We're uh, a independent firm located in Dublin. We have four certified financial planners. Um, so this is kind of how we accumulated knowledge on the subject uh, that we're speaking about today. So with that in mind, um, in this great technology that we have, we're kind of, and believe it or not, within an hour, we're gonna probably move through most of that agenda. Um, as Doreen mentioned, I definitely welcome questions. Maybe if I think I'm gonna cover something, I might defer it till, till the end. And certainly I can stay afterwards if, uh, you have some individual issues you'd like to talk about. So, you know, this is pretty self-explanatory and I don't need to sit up here and, and tell you about this too much, but uh, I thought I would list the, the reasons why we wanna be organized. Obviously we can save money through better organization. If you're dealing with, you know, tax preparation people or a CPA, if you're dealing with attorneys, uh, many financial planners such as myself, either work on an hourly basis um, as, as do other professionals. So obviously if you go in with the proverbial, you know, bushel basket of information, you're gonna probably be charged a lot more as they try to help, you know, with the organization. But if you go in organized, you can really save on, on fees of the professional advisors. Saving time, I think we all get into this issue that whether it's something about taxes or health care, uh, you know, you're working on a claim of a health care, 
or a financial matter, an investment matter, and you have to locate something, obviously it can be very frustrating. And the more organized you are, the more places that you know you, you need to go to, uh, the better, I think. Avoiding mistakes. I could probably give a two hour program unto itself about mistakes that you know, many of us and we all have made from time to time. Uh, so trying to avoid those mistakes are very, very important. I'll give a couple of examples. Beneficiary designations on life, let's say life insurance. I can't tell you how many times, particularly when people were working, they have group uh, uh, insurance. On, and, you know, they may have named somebody, maybe they went to work before they got married and they named their mother or dad on these policies. Well, you know, as time goes on, they get married, uh, even at their time of retirement, they never get around to changing those beneficiaries to their own spouse even. So that's just kind of one example of, and I'm going to get back to beneficiary designations a little bit later as well in making sure you title things properly with your assets. But I'll get back to that. But also and another thing that comes to mind is uh, unclaimed funds. I just heard on the Today Show this morning, they were talking about that issue as well. Um, and that is the amount of money that goes unclaimed. Uh, is just amazing. It's really in the billions of dollars nationally. I was under a little bit misimpression on part of that because I always felt that if it doesn't get claimed in two or three years, then the, the state takes over control of that money. Well, as I'm learning a little bit more, I'm not sure that really takes place. <laughs> they may use the money or something, but the, the money doesn't necessarily get turned over to the estate. It's, it's available. It's out there. So, and we run into this so much at the time of a state settlement that um, these funds go on unclaimed. And so the estate's getting settled, right? And I don't know if you've had this happen, but after the estate settled two or three years later, you get a letter or something that, hey, did you know you had this asset um, or this person lived in a different state or you had this life insurance? And so you can claim it often at that point if, you're ha if you happen to get notified. But uh, then you have to open up the estate again, usually, and that can be very costly and time consuming. So simple thing or not simple, but you know, what I, when I'm named executor or something, I want to make sure that I know where that client has lived, maybe multiple states, and I want to know who they work for. So I always go through that process with my client. Um, so, you know, if, if through employment, if they've gotten moved around a lot, then we want to contact prior employees. A lot of times there's something that wasn't claimed, a life insurance policy or, you know, investments, often investments too. Um, I remember when they broke up AT&T and they, they issued out all these stocks, these Bell System companies. And so... A lot of these people never, you know, never claim that. And so, again, just a, a word that you can go on unclaimed funds on the Internet and then go into the state and usually get connected to the treasurer department of that state. And then you can access and look at, you know, unclaimed funds that may be out there. So I kind of got off on a tangent there, but I thought it was important. I think uh, the more organized you are, the, the less stress, I think, people feel more peace of mind. Um, I think people tend to be a little bit more confident if, if they're very well organized. Um, you know, reducing clutter and space within the house is, is a benefit as well. Now, I kept that last one on purpose, and that is a gift. I can't think of a better gift that you can give a spouse if there's a spouse children that you're going to ask to help maybe settle your estate, or your executor. I can't think of a better gift than maybe to be organized. So with that in mind, um, I'll mention what I consider to be, a, you know, necessary things within an organization system. And that is a document locator or some kind of a valuable log book. What I have here and also in your handouts, which we'll get to later, 
I copied a number of forms that is in this book, Vital Papers Log Book. Unfortunately, this was put out by AARP, very nice book, but they discontinued it years ago. I got permission to still use it, and I just kind of make copies out of it. Uh, some of the handouts that you have are not every, every uh, part of this book, but really you can just go online to again, or any bookstore. There's just a lot of things out there to may be helpful for you for, uh, you know, recording your, your valuable information. And we'll get into some of those forms in a few minutes. But again, you can do it, you know, write it out hard copy. A lot of times I'll have people do it in pencil because some things are going to change, but you can do it hard copy and all kinds of electronic assistance, you know, the thumb drives or the disks that you can buy. There are some companies that actually give you kind of pre-formatted disks that you can put information on. Um, so there's all kinds of things. And now there's cloud storage, right? That uh, you can store stuff in the cloud. And so you want to be very careful of the security of that. Um, I'm going to talk about one, one option a little bit later that doesn't cost anything that we're pretty comfortable with from a security standpoint. Um, so a document locator in some form or another, a home filing system, um, and your system may be the best uh, to stay with, a safety deposit box or a home safe, or maybe some people do both, and then, of course, a good shredder or access to a good shredder, very, very important nowadays. So um, I was going to mention kind of what I do, and it's not any better than what probably anybody else does, but what I ended up doing was getting three large um, three ring binders. And I mean those large ones. Three uh, I think. Look, at these people will not quit chatting. I don't know where that's coming from. So um, we're not hearing anything out here, I don't think particularly. Uh, so, you know, they're like three or four or five inch, you know, three ring binders. In one of those binders, I put all my estate planning documents in. Um, my wife and I have a trust, you know, that may or may not be necessary for a lot of people. Even if you have a trust, you usually have what's called pour over wills. You have your financial powers of attorney, hopefully, and then you have your health care powers. You might have a HIPAA form in there and some, some other things of that nature. Well, believe it or not, I can get, you know, I punch those and I can get all those in to that binder, uh, the original copies. And by the way, we'll talk about, should I have original copies at home or not? So we'll talk about that. Um, then in my other binder, I have kind of everything else financially that hopefully is kind of one source that my executor can go to. My wife and I have IRAs. Now you can't put those thick documents in there for sure, but I can keep uh, the IRA statement, the cover sheet that shows the, uh, my, IRA, you know, number and what the current balance is and things like that. I have a 401k. I put that in there. Um, we have life insurance. She has a policy. I have a policy. Can't put the whole policy in there, but I can put the cover sheet showing the policy number and what the death benefit is and uh, what else do we have in there. We have long-term care insurance, so I have the cover sheet of that. Um, you know, in our health insurance, I have a uh, Medicare supplement and things of that nature. So I got all that in. So I have representation of about everything I own. By the way, also brokerage account statements and, and things of that nature. So, um, and then I have a four drawer file cabinet. I don't need all four drawers for this purpose, but one of the drawers I use for backup to all these things in my binder. So I actually have the you know, the full latest statement from uh, the brokerage account. You know, it's five or six pages or so. So I have files corresponding to everything in that binder. So I just thought I'd mention that, but again, your system may be, uh, you know, serving the purpose very, very well. Now I will say I'm a little superstitious because I'm trying to make everything very easy for my executor who happens to be my oldest son and uh, my oldest daughter. We have uh, five, four kids, so we kind of split things up. So I'm a little superstitious. So when I go on vacation, 
with my wife or, you know, particularly if we're taking a plane, I take these binders out and I put them on my chair in my office, make it real easy. But I'll tell you, I'm so happy when I come home, I can get those <laughs> back in the, you know, in, in my uh, closet. So that's, that's kind of my little superstition. Um, we also then listed some of these other websites that you can go into and, uh, and maybe uh, be helpful to you. You know, um, we've got, and I kind of divide important documents up into um, financial type documents versus maybe a state type documents. So I was going to chat a little bit about these different documents for a minute. And particularly the legal ones, so many of the important documents are of a legal nature. And uh, I always like to mention, and by the way, again, I'm a certified financial planner, not an attorney. So I'm, I'm kind of talking to you uh, as a financial planner more than strictly as, you know, an attorney, which I don't have the background for. But in my way of thinking, there's, I've listed three, but I think there's actually four main ways that we pass our assets on to those after us. And of course, it's by will or trust or by titling our assets properly. And the one that I didn't have up there that I should is gifting. Of course, we can, we can gift assets away. It's a way of passing assets on. And then this is probably a very much of a reminder to you, but I always like to kind of refresh thinking on it. When you pass something by will, right? it automatically goes through probate. That's a part of the process. So anything that passed by will is definitely goes through probate and it's under the jurisdiction or oversight of the probate court. And then it gets passed out to beneficiaries. Um, a lot of times I hear, uh, you know, kind of negative. Yes, sir. If something is left in a will and the will says free of probate, does that negate it from the probate process? I don't believe so the way you're describing it because that's what a will does and a will must be probate. And so it's gonna have to be presented to the court. And so I don't think language within a will is gonna accomplish that. I see. But what will accomplish that is titling the property appropriately. Titling supersedes passing by will. So, and let's go through some examples like your bank account products are payable on death, right? You can set up payable on death. These are mistakes I see and, and maybe, you know, it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish and who you're, who you're working with on it. But make sure, you know, if you add a, let's say a child to a bank account and it's, you know, you maybe have, been making a, you make a gift to them in a way, mm -hmm. because depending on how that titling is, they can access that and maybe you want it that way uh, while you're alive. So a lot of people that don't want to give up that authority or ownership right away could set things up POD, payable on death, which means that they can't access it during your life, but at death, they can pass that on. And, and it goes directly to them, not through by will and not through the probate. And we, almost every asset now, that's one good positive change. Almost every asset you own can be set up to bypass probate if that's what you want. So even car titles, although I think like Franklin County is very liberal on cars being passed, not needing to go through probate, but you could actually title the car to, you know, to go directly to whomever. Your house deed is a big one, too, if you're still in a house. Uh, how, set that up. So if you wanted to have your house or house deed passed without probate, because probate has time and expenses to play itself out, so you could have a, it's really, in effect, a transferable on deed, transferable on death, I should say. Uh, TOD, transferable on death. You can um, set up your brokerage accounts for uh, transferable on death, again, to avoid the probate. Uh, any beneficiary designations, life insurance or annuities and things like that where you can name beneficiaries, that's gonna go direct. So 
Now, again, if you have multiple children, you got to be careful that, you know, you're not having things get unequal if, if that's what you want. On the other hand, that maybe there's some special needs that you want to have some things unequal. So, so again, so wills go through probate um, and titling goes direct and trust is another option. There's many different kinds of trust, revocable, which means you can change it. You stay in control. They use your own social security number for you know, tax filings and things like that or irrevocable, that's kind of a whole different topic, but uh, you know, maybe for long-term care purposes that could come into play. Um, and so, you know, that's a lot, a lot of uh, issues involving whether one needs a trust or not. But, um, you know, where we see it now coming into play because, you know, we can give so much assets, amount of assets, 12 million and a few hundred thousand, we can all give up during our life without any federal state tax. And we don't have a state of tax here, state of state tax in Ohio, they've done away with that. So that was the purpose of a lot of the, what we call the irrevocable trust, which doesn't concern most people nowadays, but there could be other reasons for having revocable trust. Um, if you have some complicated situation in your wanting, you know, distribution plan, if you have uh, maybe real estate outside of Ohio, you want to kind of get everything consolidated, a trust might serve a good purpose for that. You know, second marriages where you got their kids and my kids and things like that, and you want to kind of handle things differently from maybe trust can, can well serve that. So um, again, you may be all set up and, and don't need to revisit that, but uh, those are some of the things to maybe to think about as well. Um, yeah, we have a question in the chat. Um, okay. Actually, there's two questions. Um, it says, so TOD avoids probate, like TOD of a house deed or other properties without probate? Yes, that's, that would be the purpose for that titling. And of course, you have to formally change your title to, ha to have that wording. Um, and another thing, when there is a spousal involved and they still own a home, again, survivorship language will take care of that too, at least between spouses. So we used to run into a lot of problems. I don't see it too much anymore where they people, Originally, they had put the house deed in both their names. So it's uh, Mary Jones and Tom Jones. But they didn't have this important survivorship language. So when one of them passed away, well, the other spouse really was considered to own one half of the house. The other undivided interest in that house needed to go through probate to get it all over to the surviving spouse. Well, a very simple way to avoid that issue if it even exists nowadays, is survivorship language. But it's very important that be put on the title. And there's kind of different languages an, an attorney will tell you, but basically rights of survivorship. So Tom Jones with rights of survivorship to Mary Jones. Or I presume the second I question on that, Jerry, is in that case, is TOD better than a will? Well, I mean, that's individual circumstances again, because I'm not here to badmouth probate. There can be some very important uh, responsibilities that probate can, can carry out for you. You know, maybe a single individual that doesn't have a lot of family, they really want the oversight of the court to make, make sure things are passed out according to their wishes. Um, so it's really an individual situation. Um, you know, wills, and back and forth, um, wills are public. Probate is public information. So a lot of people don't care you know, about privacy much, but other people do care about privacy. And so that would go on the advantage of the trust, the irrevocable trust. Because I like to think of things simply, and a trust is really a contract between you and your beneficiaries saying, we don't need you probate. We know what we want to do. And so we're going to put it it's in effect a contract between you and your beneficiaries. 
And so it doesn't have to become uh, public and it doesn't technically have to go through probate. Um, and there's different kinds of sizes of probate. So, um, you know, if you have most everything titled by title, uh, or you have most everything put in a trust, but you have a few things that are outside, then you might have what's called kind of a summary probate. So it's much less costly, quicker type thing. But if it's if your probate estate is over a certain value, it, it can get more in depth and more involved and more complicated. I was there another? Did that answer the questions? Okay. Um, we come back to some of that as well. I like to spend a little time on the financial powers of attorney because I see that missing from a lot of people's estates uh, or not updated. So that's very, very important. So the durable power is you execute that while you're alive. When you die, it becomes invalidated. So it's a, a document to be available during your life. And it merely gives other people that you name the power to work in your behalf financially when you can't do it for yourself. I've put two types down there for a purpose, durable power and the springing power. I don't know if you've heard of those two different terminologies, but the durable power, um, when you're giving that power to somebody else, that you're actually giving that, them that power immediately upon you know, the creation of that document. Now you hope they don't use it. And, you know, generally you're giving that to somebody very trusted that wouldn't take advantage. Um, but technically you're giving them that power right away. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's available for use when, whenever a situation would occur. And yes, there could be, you know, uh, fraudulent use of it, but we don't see that a lot. So. In cases where there is some concern along those lines, there can be put in effect what's called a springing power. Like the name implies, when you execute that document, you're not giving the authority right at that time to that person, but that power will transfer at a future point in time. And that future point will be determined generally by two physicians or two doctors. They're the ones that are gonna decide, hey, you cannot function adequately or for your own protection. So we, we now say that the power should be transferred to that person of your choice. So just be aware of that. Honestly, for, for most people, they're still comfortable with the durable. Um, and so that's a choice that, uh, that you have. Um, so, Jerry, question. Yes. So huh? springing power of attorney overrides healthcare power of attorney? Yeah, two different two different, uh, and because you, you might want to give different people the powers for health versus financial. So there are two separate and they function separately. One is for financial, one is for health. And um, of course the uh, durable power or the, I should say the healthcare power for health, um, you know, you're, you're uh, stating your wishes about um, who you want to have you know, make some healthcare decisions while you're alive. And the living will, of course, is withholding, you know, life-saving, you know, treatments and things of that nature. So both very, very important. You know, the HIPAA is another thing that gets overlooked a lot. A lot of times when you go into a doctor's office, you, you fill that out, but that's maybe just for that one, you know, occurrence and whatnot. What we run into now, although doctors are and Physicians and hospitals are pretty liberal on this, but I'm not sure they should be. So when you want others, and particularly if you have children spread around the country or you know, even within the city, um, if you want them to be able to know the status of your health, if you were to be hospitalized and you can't function for yourself, um, you ought to really be giving or having HIPAA forms, giving them permission not to make decisions necessarily, but at least to know about the status of your health. So that's something else. Another thing we encourage too, and I think maybe most of us in the room have uh, probably pretty grown um, children by now, but when a child reaches 18, so maybe it's grandchildren we 
we're thinking about here, but really they, uh, to have the HIPAA forms in place because you know they're running all over the place and things can happen. Um, but also really they, uh, they should be ex exercising maybe these healthcare powers and things of that nature. You tend not to want to think about that for those folks real young, but Jerry, if we could back up to the uh, passing assets to heirs. Sure, uh, the, sure. Uh, transfer on death for a home. Uh, there's also a living trust. I presume the living trust then excludes you from certain legal ramifications, say that, you know, you were to be sued or something like that. Is that correct? They can, um, and it kind of depends on the asset too, is my understanding. I'd like you to probably really confer my comments with a, an attorney, mm -hmm. but my understanding or experience is um, the trust can afford some, uh, some assistance against lawsuits and things like that, certainly with certain assets. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of your question, can you repeat that again? Well, I was wondering the difference between like oh. say, a simple, say, transfer on death oh, okay. uh, yeah. designation as opposed to uh, having the home yeah. and living trust. Yeah. Um, essentially, as far as the transfer is concerned, without probate, they would function the same I see. from a probate standpoint. Mm -hmm. You might pick up, like we said, some liability protections with, with the trust that maybe the other doesn't afford. I see. The, uh, titling. Those are great questions. I appreciate that. Jerry, be, um, we also have a question in the chat. Um, it says, would that HOA be legal knowing the mental status of the patient? Should the person writing its own health care power of attorney should be mentally stable and, and, and good and found to have made and signed a health care power of attorney? Um, and then can that be contested? That's a great question. And if I understand the question, you have to be in sound mind when you execute the financial power um, and I believe the healthcare power as well. And any reputable attorney, you know, will kind of put you through a little bit of a test, you know, when they're face to face with you to make sure they're, they're doing that on their own free volition and that that attorney would sense that they know what they're doing and in the right cognitive state to know what they're doing and not coming in with, you know, the neighbor that maybe has ulterior motives. So they're gonna wanna make sure that client executing those documents are at least at a certain level of cognitive consigned for themselves unless they have some kind of handicap, um, so. Hopefully that addresses the question. <clears throat> Important documents and records. You know, everything is, gets more and more and more complicated, financial, healthcare issues, uh, investment issues and things like that. So it, it becomes more and more challenging. So we're gonna go through, you know, a little bit about what to keep, how long to keep it, you know, what can you feel comfortable pitching and, and of course, where to keep it as well. So I think the first, yeah, and I think your handout would be reflective of this as well. And really, this is pretty, a lot of this is pretty logical uh, when it comes to how long do you keep things, but there's some things that you might question. But obviously, you know, like we've listed here, the wills, birth certificates, things that need to be kept permanently, you're going to you know, hopefully keep permanently. We're going to talk about where you might want to keep these passports, military records, um, birth certificates, and things of that nature. Um, then if we touch on taxes there, um, you know, a lot of advisors may kind of disagree or, you know, have a little different feel for it in terms of length of time. Most advisors that I talk to and authorities kind of centered in on the seven-year rule, if you will, to keep, you know, tax returns and anything that supports the tax returns for generally a seven-year period. Um, you know, the IRS is, is low on uh, those that can audit, but you still stand uh, a chance of audit on a routine audit. And so uh, they will typically look 
at least three years back. And typically your audit will be a, at least a couple or three years back uh, if it gets chosen for audit. So definitely keep you know, three years and everything that supports that. And if you, um, and really you should keep you know, full, full records for seven years is, is the highly recommended period of time on that. And then I think a little later in the uh, retention form here, really any kind of supporting information for your deductions and health, uh, maybe healthcare claims and things of that nature should be kept for that period of time too. Insurance, um, obviously, if you have a permanent or whole life policy that's still in effect, you're going to want to keep that for permanently or until the, the death benefit runs out. Um, you know, if you have term insurance and the term has been completed, again, it's actually something that can cause problems that or at least headaches for your executor is if you have a lot of these insurance policies that aren't in force, um, and a lot of them have changed companies, they've merged and it's a different company from you know the pot what the policy is saying. You can actually do your executor a favor by getting rid of those or shredding those if they're not in force whatsoever. Now, a little bit of an exception on that would be we see a lot of class action suits uh, when it comes to insurance and invest investments sometimes. So sometimes to settle the uh, the uh, claim, the insurance company might extend the death benefit coverage for an extra year or two or something like that. So I kind of keep the, even the term of policies, I kind of keep for a couple of years. And then if, you know, if you're not hearing any uh, settlement type issues or, or claims of that nature, then I think you can feel comfortable and, and maybe do your executive favor by, by getting rid of those. Um, so that kind of covers maybe a little bit on the insurances. Investments can be kind of a headache. Starting in 2008, so it's been quite some time ago, in, uh, investment companies, um, mutual fund companies, brokerage companies are required to keep what, what's called your cost basis. And this can cause all kinds of trouble <laughs> or headaches. So obviously when you buy a stock or a mutual fund, whatever you purchase it at becomes your cost basis. Now dividends can influence the cost basis as well. So it can it cause adjustments in that cost basis. So when you go to sell it, maybe you sold it within the year for a short-term gain or loss, or you held it 12 months, or after that, it's either maybe a long-term loss or gain. Well, again, since 2008, if you, those transactions need to be recorded and provided by the uh, investment company. But if you've held stocks prior to that, then it is your responsibility. And that can cause headaches to try to retrace or track back if, you know, if, if those, those records haven't been uh, maintained. So that's where it becomes a little problematic, but um, it is important, but you know you have help for at least since 2008 in uh, tracking those. Uh, retirement plans, um, everybody here is probably familiar with required minimum distributions, RMDs. Maybe you haven't started them yet, but um, now if you've been drawing down on your IRAs, your 401k, uh, these different retirement plans, maybe if you taught you had a 403b, those are just different IRS codes for the retirement accounts. Well, if you haven't taken money out prior to, they just changed it, by the way, recently, uh, till age 72, uh, then the government requires you to take out a certain, at least a certain amount, and that they want to get their hands on some of that tax money they've allowed to have you defer it all those years. Now, if you've already started those earlier, or you know, you're, you're probably fine, but you do want to make sure and it does become your responsibility. Now, good investment companies will help you track that and help you figure out what those, uh, those are. But ultimately, it does uh, lie on your responsibility to make sure those are done timely and um, accurately. And of course, what they're doing is they're looking at your account balance for the December 31st prior, prior to you taking that money out. 
And then it's a factor based on your longevity and it changes a little bit every year and they recalculate that. So, um, and again, the reason why I mention it in terms of, is to maybe it's, it's a kind of good thing for you to maybe keep track of that too, just to, to be able to prove that. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in a minute. How long do you keep these statements? Well, we kind of like people keeping the December 31st statement of retirement accounts, you know, pretty long. You may just keep one page of that to be able to prove this is what the account balance was. Maybe even note on there what your required distribution was so you can prove that. Maybe at least keep that seven years because in an audit, you might rarely, rarely, but you might be asked to, to justify that and hopefully get help with that. And then where it says other receipts, um, that's just a reminder again, seven years for anything that you need to support that, uh, that uh, tax form. Well, here's another challenge too, I think. It's where do you keep these things? This is a simple little form. I think you have it in your handout. Uh, welcome to use it if it helps. And uh, also advisors have some good debates on this as well, I guess. So. I think this is part comfort level, uh, but part rationale as to maybe good places to keep things. So this little form says, well, where is it located? Do I keep it at home? Do I keep it in my lockbox? Do I keep it at the bank lockbox? Do I keep it with my executor? And uh, by the way, some of these forms, I like to make additional copies and give them to my executor if you're comfortable in doing that. Um, or putting one in the lockbox and having one at home on some of these doc documented forms. But the one that I think gives people the most uh, challenge is where do I keep my, a lot of my estate planning documents, particularly my will. Um, again, you may have a trust. Where do I keep that? Well, in the case of a will, you need to present the original to the probate. Um, even if there's really virtually no probate, if there's the will, you need to present that. And then the executor needs to get approved and named as executor. Uh, even though there could be no probate, um, they still have to present the will uh, if, if there is one and there should be one. Um, so now where do we keep that since you have to show the original? Well, do you keep that at home? Are you comfortable doing that? We know that, you know, a fire can take place or, you know, things can get lost or, that type of situation. Do I let my attorney exec, uh, do I let my attorney keep it? Do I let my executor keep it? Now, a lot of attorneys like to keep it as well. And maybe there's good justification because they may have a tremendously, a, a big safe and it might be very fire retardant. And so they've got that security for you. They also kind of like that too, a lot of them, because at the time of settlement, you know, the executor, where do they have to go to get it? So they go back to the attorney that wrote the will, because really the executors generally don't, aren't required to deal with the same attorney you use to write that will, but they may choose to, or may, you may want them to, but they, they're not obligated to generally, unless you spell that out. So, you know, and attorneys die sometimes before we do, and they retire maybe sometimes before we do. So, so there's that. The couple of attorneys that we deal with, their solution is to write two originals. That possibly could cause problems. I haven't seen it cause a problem yet. So that particularly if you don't have a good safe place to keep it, um, you know, they're gonna keep one maybe, or you put one in the lockbox and then one at home for easy, easy reference. While I'm on that topic of keeping it maybe at a bank lockbox, um, that's important to discuss with your own bank because they can differ. And that is, um, well, first of all, maybe giving authority to have somebody other than you, maybe a spouse or trusted executor, have the authority to go into that lockbox if you give them that authority. But generally, the, man, uh, the bank will restrict you or your representative as to what they can take out before it goes through the process of a tax release is the big thing that, so they're gonna hold things in that black box until the tax release gets you know, issued. 
saying that you don't owe taxes uh, and, and proves that to the bank. So that's something to think about, but I kind of like that idea for a lot of people to maybe have two originals. Other than that, I think it's kind of up to you. I personally, on that left side, things at home, I keep things that are maybe important, but that can be replaced. And that might be insurance policies, um, annuities, if you have annuities, um, tax returns, I, I keep at home. Um, and you know, there is one authority that has every tax return that you've ever submitted. So the IRS can replace those if need be. Uh, so that you have that back up. And I keep bank statements and things of that nature. I think there's some requirement on retention of records. I know there is for banks and uh, credit unions, but they may have some uh, liberalization there as to how long they keep it. So you may wanna check with them. I believe it's maybe at least eight years. Um, some keep longer than that. So, you know, bank statements um, and so much of the stuff is online nowadays. So that's the kind of things I keep uh, at home. I keep that one original will at home. Um, then it's up to you uh, maybe as to how and when you want to um, share stuff with your executor or what you choose to have your attorney keep in that middle column. Uh, stuff on the right side is stuff that's very hard or irreplaceable, really. And so on the right side, I have a lockbox that uh, and I haven't gone with the home safe, but I think about that sometimes. But so I have uh, the safe deposit box, my birth certificates, anything like, you know, you might have a bare, uh, bare, bare bond type thing that's transferable. CDs, I keep, you know, if I have a CD, I'll keep that in the lockbox. Deeds, if it's a big enough lockbox. Death certificates. For the people that I've helped, um, my in-laws and my own parents, I, I've kept one uh, death certificate back, an original. And, and that happened to my, my father, as a matter of fact. It was one of those, I was so proud because I, I was asked to serve in the capacity. He actually had a trust. And by the way, if you do have a trust, you need to rename things in that trust or it, it's not going to pass by trust. So you put your assets, title them in the name of that trust. So I thought I had an airtight estate plan the way he wanted it. And we had everything and he kept good records and we went through everything. And so no probate, everything was great. Got it distributed to my other two siblings. And lo and behold, three years later, we got one of those letters. Uh, $30,000 um, army life insurance policy. So sure, it was, it was worth opening up the estate, but it was a hassle to reopen that up. You know, time had gone by. So another example of uh, trying to get things documented and, and handled properly. Um, now, another thing that's good, it's kind of off, maybe off topic, is your personal property and things of that nature. Uh, attorneys handle that a little bit differently. Some of them actually come up with a little uh, extra little document to record where you want your personal property to go. So that might be good to pin down in advance. Um, but also just while you're living to be able to recount what you have. I've had two clients, their house totally burnt down. And so they had great insurance to, for replacement value. But they couldn't reconstruct everything. Can you reconstruct everything in even your own living room? So, you know, if you have a camcorder type thing or borrow one, I think that's kind of the <clears> easiest <throat> way. And just kind of walk room by room and, and take a video and maybe even verbally describe, particularly if you have some valuable things of that nature. So that's a little sidebar, but maybe important. Um, now, this is my favorite document right here in the sense that if you don't do anything else from our program today, and maybe you've already done something of this nature, but at least maybe consider doing this one form. And this one form merely is telling your important people or your executor, where at least tell them where it's located, whether it's totally organized or not. So it's just a little checklist. Where is this? Is it home? Is it my file cabinet? 
Is it in my three ring binder? Is it with my attorney? Is it with my executor? Does my spouse have access to that? Is it in my lockbox? So right here, this thing can really save a lot of headaches. It documents what your important property is and, and where it's located. Enough said on that. And I put this form in too. It's kind of as a result of me being a financial planner, I guess. But, <laughs> but just uh, um, a little form, or you may have other forms that you use. But um, we really like you taking account of everything at least once a year. If you are dealing with an advisor, hopefully that person is. And because things can change, particularly we're in a very volatile situation uh, with our investment assets right now and our bank accounts haven't been earning too much. But um, maybe this form can help you. Um, but if you have a, an allocation or a portfolio composed of different assets, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, things can easily get out of balance depending on what's happening in the economy and what's happening in the market. So to kind of take stock of things at least once a year and uh, think about rebalancing, and that's kind of what that form's for. And use that if you your will. Um, some of these other forms, I think it's very important um, just to, to state down your professional advisors. So if you can't act for yourself, at least someone can help you find those that uh, can take care of you. I was helping an individual client that literally, well, she had a couple of remote cousins that she wasn't in touch with, but she um, she picked a neighbor to help her with her health care powers, but that was the only really person close by. And uh, so she was uh, committed to a nursing home, but she was cognitive issues and things like that. So she started really having some dental problems. And they had a heck of a time tracking down her dentist that, you know, where that was. So something like this could have really been handy and saved the uh, healthcare power quite a bit of uh, time and stress. Um, this is kind of back to our estate planning document. This might help or maybe be unnecessary for you at this point. But I kind of look at it as a team. You want an estate planning team. And so this is a little form to give, give thought to that, um, to name your trustees and executors. And it reminds me of another issue we run into a lot is to make sure you, and it can be difficult to name backup people can serve if the primary people cannot serve. And, you know, when you name them as primaries, they may be very willing and help, able and cognitive, able and et cetera, et cetera, or live in town or whatever reasons. But of course that can change. So um, I, I've been named executor on one that I'm really not sure at, at the time that I'm going to want to serve. And I, and I had that open discussion with them. So if certain conditions arise and the issue that I have actually is their two children, um, really good relationship with the couple and they really want me to serve in that capacity, but I would only want to if those children, you know, uh, cooperate with the distribution. So we had that out. So purpose of bringing that up is that people for one reason or other may not want to serve at the time or able to. So backups are very important for the healthcare powers, the financial powers, as well as the you know, will and trust powers as well. Well, I'm going to wrap up pretty pretty quick here. I can open things up for questions again. Some of these other forms, it just depends on how detailed you want to get on recording, you know, bank records and, and investments and things of that nature. I let my three-ring binder kind of serve in that, so I don't do a great job myself in keeping these forms up because I think I've got another source where they can go to and get updates and know what the account numbers are and things of that nature. But other people might want to just have it recorded, hard copy and keep it up. And like I said, you may want to do it in pencil. Credit cards, um, 
again, that can be very important to, uh, to keep track of. I've always done the old system of putting them on a Xerox machine and kind of copying them front and back if that is legible. So if something happens, you know, you can notify the credit card companies very quickly if something gets stolen or, or misplaced. But there is a form for that, form for insurance, if you want to document your policies. Um, we kind of cover this. You could actually try to document your household inventory. I like that camcorder idea, but that's what different people do. Um, your retirement income. And again, obviously, while you're alive, look on, you know, unclaimed funds, make sure you check in with employers while you're alive, or at least let your executors know that uh, you've had these different places of employment. And I'll conclude with this, that, you know, if you really want to go that ultimate mile, you can do, you know, your funeral planning as well. And very importantly, I don't know, yeah, Write your own obituary. Who in the world is going to say the glorious things that, <laughs> that you deserve to be said about you than yourself? So don't leave that to somebody else. <laughs> Make sure you do that yourself. Very good. Well, listen, uh, it's been great being with you. Um, we're about at that closing hour, but I don't have anywhere to go for a while. So if there's any questions. Uh, do you have these electronically that we can have access to? Um, I don't. But other than I could scan them or something and send them to you as an attachment, but okay, I, I could scan oh, them. It's not fillable form. No, it's not in a fillable form format as far as that goes. They're still, they're still great documents, they are. Yeah. That's the early really, really, really Okay, yeah. at least it might yeah, stimulate your thinking on it. Yeah. Well, I, I guess this is a question for Darlene. If there were extra copies of these documents, could we just stop by the, I'm on Zoom, obviously, could we stop by the cancer support community and pick up a packet? Yeah, actually, Susan, what I was planning on doing is, um, Jerry did give me a handout, both of uh, the document, both documents of his PowerPoint, as well as those extra document checklist forms. I was just going to scan them and then email them to everybody who's on Zoom. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Any last minute questions for Jerry before we wrap up? Very helpful. Currently, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Currently, I'm executor of an estate. Okay. It's out of state. It's up in Maine. Yeah. Uh, the home was left in the will to be the proceeds given to a trust. Okay. Okay. Um, the property itself says that I, as executor, can do as I choose, sell it private, sell it public, uh, any thing in any way that I deem wise, free of probate. But what I'm hearing from you is that's not necessarily free of probate because that it, the home was not in the trust, it was in the will. It still is going to have, the sale will actually still have to be okayed by the probate. That's what it sounds like to me. Okay. Now, Again, because it needed to be, generally it would have needed to be titled before the death of the owner. Mm -hmm. So that's where the problem that. lies, but I don't know. I mean, I would still maybe approach the probate and see if anything can be done, but it doesn't sound like it. Uh, so it might have to flow through there. You know what to... that process is, how involved that probate process is. I mean, is not particularly out of state, I wouldn't either. Okay. It actually can vary county by county. Uh -huh. um, and I, I've been told this by the attorneys, not necessarily a lot of personal experience, but I think we actually have a pretty favorable probate court in Franklin County. Mm -hmm. We're pretty lucky, is what I understand. But I don't know out of state particularly. But well, I know they have two. They have a formal probate yep. for estates over, you know, so many million yeah. and then informal. Yeah. So yeah. this is informal, but yeah. at the same time, you know, it's a sizable amount of money at home and so forth. But so yes. Then uh, we have another total program on long-term care planning. Mm -hmm. uh, insurance is only a part of it. It's just the total options that you have and, and 
how to handle things from an asset standpoint and things like that. And actually, either myself and our elder law attorney that's in our network has really good programs on that. Sometimes we'll do it together, but uh, so that's that's another aspect of titling assets properly and things like that. If there's contemplation of long-term care. Okay, well, we want to thank Jerry again for his time and his expertise. Uh, we greatly appreciate you uh, joining us today for the lunchtime learning. Again, everybody who is on Zoom, I'll be emailing all of the documents and handouts that he said that he uh, gave me in addition to the link to the survey monkey evaluation. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, these programs are offered at no cost um, and we'd like to show and report back to our funders the importance of being able to continue these programs. So I thank you in advance for completing that evaluation. Uh, the deadline, I'll be closing that survey uh, five o'clock on Friday. So Jerry, thank you again. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their Wednesday. Thank you, Darlene. Thank, thank you. you.